Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University of Ottawa, uh, and then on to uh, Department of Chemical Engineering here at McGill University. Um, you did your, um, your doctorate at MIT uh, under the supervision of Professor Gang Chen, and, and your thesis was essentially thermal transport at the nanoscale. Um, and so we're excited to hear some of the research that you're going to present today, uh, and looking forward to it. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, well, it's, it's great to, to be here um, in half person. Um, thanks for the, the warm welcome, David. Um, I'm looking forward to getting a chance to know you better um, in the times to come. Uh, so let's, let's get started. Um, this talk is going to be generally about the different phonon regimes, uh, different phonon transport regimes that we can uh, probe both theoretically and experimentally. And I'm going to um, go over some case studies of, of these different regimes. Ah, okay, so why, why do we, we care so much about um, thermal transport? Well, as it, from an engineering perspective, right, it, heat is everywhere and often has sort of the um, net negative of reducing the efficiency in our devices. Uh, so it's become sort of an engineering challenge to understand heat transfer across time and length scales. And what I mean by that is that um, thermodynamically, heat is a ubiquitous process and we can uh, understand that in terms of the scale of the universe and uh, the galaxy or solar system, right? We have our energy from the sun and we like to harvest it. We have the thermal energy that's waste heat produced by our, our computer chips and we would like to minimize that. Um, and then we also have all the way down to the quantum scale, we have things like, like decoherence that we want to sort of minimize if we are interested in um, preserving the lifetime of a qubit, for instance, right? So we, we, we have this, this ubiquity across, across length scales. How can we um, start from a, a, uh, a bottom-up approach and deal with this grand scale problem? And the way we do that is by uh, taking our, our reductionist approach that we um, have come to use in, in science and engineering, and that's looking at the microscopic carriers of heat. Uh, and, and some examples are, are shown here. So we have things like electrons, photons, and, and, and we can have magnetic spin waves. Um, in the, in the, case, uh, the cases that I will show you um, and, the, and the work that follows, I will focus on, on specifically phonons. Um, so we're interested in, in things like semiconductors, dielectrics, uh, where phonons are the principal carriers of heat. So of course, some of the, the, the material and the, the frameworks that I'm gonna discuss here can be extended to, to uh, maybe magnons and electrons, but um, I wanna just show, focus on phonons for now and, and convince you of, of, of the, the framework that we have as, as being a useful um, way of looking at, at thermal transport at the nanoscale. Okay, so um, I'm speaking to physicists here and not engineers, but I, I still want to bring everyone up to speed on, on how we think about phonons. And as engineers, we like to think about things firstly from a, a classical scale. So uh, you'll, you'll have to excuse me on that. And uh, what we do really is we, we, we have a, a discrete lattice and we have our, our point masses that are connected by, by linear springs. And we can write down these, the equations of motions for these point masses um, that are essentially represents the, represent the, the, uh, the, point, the point atom in our, in our material and we can solve for the equations of motions, at least in the harmonic limit, right? So um, what I mean by that is that we uh, truncate our, our, um, our potential at, at the second order, and we can go about um, basically uh, decoupling the equations of motion in, in Fourier space and coming up with a plane wave solution um, that's described by a, a temporal frequency and a, and a spatial wave vector. And those, those, those wave vectors and frequencies can be uh, grouped together in this in this form of a dispersion, and so we can have this uh, sort of uh, parametric description of of the phonons that we're we're looking at. But we know that real materials uh, don't truncate themselves at the at the second order um, in the in the potential energy surface, and so we would need to account for this anharmonicity if we're interested in really describing real materials. So we do that in this perturbative way where we uh, include um, the third order, and we, there's work being done to include higher orders. But for now, we will only uh, think about the third order interaction. Um, and what this means is that we now essentially allow for our phonons that we're 
previously decoupled to, to interact in this, in this perturbative way. So you can think about uh, two phonons merging and becoming a, a third phonon or um, uh, one phonon splitting into to two. Um, and, and attached to that uh, process is, are these parameters that we denote as the lifetime, which we think of as the um, time between processes, between scattering events for a given, for a given phonon mode. Um, and together with that is this mean free path, which is um, in the particle picture that I will soon present. You can think of that as the uh, distance traveled by one of these, these phonons between scattering events. Um, and that will become clear um, momentarily. So we have this, this theoretical description um, of these phonons in our material. Um, and we have these different parameters that we uh, would like to attach actual numbers to, right? So if we're interested in something in, in a real material, it's not enough just to write down these symbols. We need to actually attach uh, numbers and magnitudes to these, to these uh, parameters. And how do we go about doing that? Um, for the cases that we have, have done so far, we've used this framework of density functional theory. And uh, very briefly, density functional theory is this, is this sort of workaround to solving the many body Schrodinger equation, right? So if we have a, an atomic structure, you have many atoms, you have many electrons. Um, the, the quantum mechanic description uh, turns into a many body problem. How do we work our way around that many body problem? Well, um, much work has been shown that in, in many materials, uh, at least in these simple semiconductors that I'm going to, to, to talk about today, like silicon and, and graphite, um, this single electron approximation is is sufficient to, to capture the majority of the, of the physics that we care about when it comes to phonons. Um, and what that allows us to do when we solve these uh, single electron um, Kahn-Sham equations, we can obtain an accurate description of that interatomic potential that we were, uh, that was required as, as input into our, our, um, our Hamiltonian earlier, right? So we can, we can actually write down um, numbers into these, uh, into these, Taylor, you know, Taylor series expansion coefficients. And once we've done that, we can then actually use that to at attach numbers to, to, our, um, to our phonon parameters. But how do these microscopic thermal, uh, microscopic phonon properties relate to the macroscopic properties that we um, encounter day to day, right? So when we think about a material, we think about something having a, a heat capacity and a thermal conductivity, but we have these microscopic phonon properties. How can we make that connection? We know they're related somehow. How, how do we do that? And for that, we turn to a, a, a kinetic picture, and, and that's really sort of a, a, a coarse graining or, or a zooming out, of you will, if you will, where we go from um, thinking about phonons as waves to to zooming out and thinking about them as, as wave packets and then zooming out a little further and thinking about them as, as particles. And so this is where this concept of mean free path comes in, right? So if we think about our phonons now um, as, as particles, we can think about them like a billiard ball gas moving around and um, interacting with one another and, and exchanging energy and momentum with each other, right? So you can think about a, 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 a material where we had previously discretized the lattice in terms of atomic positions to now returning back to our continuous picture here. And we've sort of, and we've, we know, we no longer think about uh, nucleus or electrons. We just think about phonons as particles moving around through this material. So from what I'm showing you here is, is, is a, is a particle moving from hot to cold um, driven by a thermal gradient. And the equation that governs this, or that describes, I should say, um, this sort of uh, picture is the, the Boltzmann transport equation, right? So uh, what we have here is, is the left-hand side of this Boltzmann transport equation here, just describing the advection of our non-equilibrium phonon distribution, right? So we have some, some distribution that describes the population of phonons in a given mode, and that moves, that propagates through our system from hot to cold in this case, according to the group velocity of that mode, um, while also simultaneously relaxing to the equilibrium distribution um, in, uh, uh, in a time determined by that, that scattering rate. So we have 
we, we, we can see here that we, we have this equation, this Boltzmann transport equation, and we immediately see that we have inputs um, of, of microscopic parameters. Um, can I ask a question quickly? Um, <clears throat> so yes. we use these, uh, you know, we use the Boltzmann transport equation to describe, you know, motion of electrons and so on. And there at least, you know, the density of particles is, I mean, the, the total number of electrons is conserved. Mm -hmm. Here we don't even have that, right? Because two mm -hmm. photons can merge into a single cone. Does that mean you have to also have some kind of a source term there in your... Uh, besides uh, relaxation from the equilibrium distribution. Sorry, can, I think if you repeat that question. So there's, uh, a, I mean, the fact uh, is that you're using a Boltzmann uh, transport equation to describe something in principle, the number of phonons is not conserved, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of very different from the usual uh, regime in which Boltzmann equation is applied in which at least, you know, electrons you, know, you apply them to electrons, the number of electrons is conserved. Um, so there should be some processes that kind of generate new phonons and, uh, and so on in your, in your Boltzmann equation. Uh, does that complicate things? Is there some significant departure between how, you know, in dense, you know, particle number conserving uh, systems versus this phonon systems? Yes, it, it does uh, change things. You, I, I think as we go, you'll get a better sense of exactly how that happens. But uh, roughly what, what we will see is that we will actually have a, a source term on this right-hand side that will produce phonons. And by, by including that, we can have this, this sort of steady production or unsteady production of, of a given mode. And what's, what's more is, is actually, th this is a very simplified uh, scattering operator that I've written down here. Um, and when, and we, when we write down a more accurate one that we will get to, uh, you, that, that idea of, of phone, the, the number not being conserved um, fits in very naturally. So, okay. All right. yeah. Okay, okay. so uh, we have this equation and we naturally want to solve it uh, to obtain expressions for temperature and heat flux, right? We were trying to, we're trying to fit this piece of the puzzle of going from the microscopic to the macroscopic observables, uh, such as temperature and, he and, and heat flux. And if we do that for a bulk system, right? If you take a, a very, you know, if you if you if take a large system and apply a very uh, small temperature gradient across that system and solve the Boltzmann transport equation, you will recover uh, your your expected Fourier's law. And in doing that process, in doing that that math, that exercise, you will actually write down an expression for thermal conductivity as a function of the microscopic heat prop, uh, microscopic phonon properties. So, so this, this, is, this is sort of the, the original insight, if you will, of, of how these, all these pieces start to fit together within the Boltzmann transport framework. But what, is, is, what comes along with this in this framework is that we don't actually have to restrict ourselves to bulk systems, right? We don't only have to look at the bulk thermal conductivity. We could look at uh, what goes on as we shrink our system and look for deviations from uh, Fourier's law. And so we're going to um, precisely go over what that, what that looks like. So, so in the diffusive regime where we expect Fourier's law to hold the length scale of our system is, is much greater than this mean free path of our phonons. And on the other extreme, we have the ballistic uh, transport regime where the mean free path is much greater than the length scale of the system, right? This, this, this makes sense. Um, and what, what, what happens there is that the phonons don't actually interact with themselves, but they just stream freely from one, from one end of the system to the other. Um, occasionally interacting with the boundaries. So no longer um, exchanging energy with themselves, um, exchanging energy uh, from one end of the system to the other. And in, in the intermediate regime, we have this, this transition from diffusive to ballistic. Um, well, I, I call it the size effects regime. Some, some other people will call it non-diffusive or quasi-ballistic other names, but essentially it, it, it's determined by the length scale of your system approaching this uh, this, this characteristic mean free path of your phonons. And to describe the transport, as, as, as I said, 
we are going to use the, the phonon uh, Boltzmann transport equation. So for the first case study in this, in this uh, work, I'm going to um, show, show you how we can use the Boltzmann transport equation to study size effects. So I've gone over some theory. How do we experimentally uh, get down to the size effect regime in our, in our semiconductors? Um, and for that, we're going to essentially harness the, the, the small weight. I, I yep. uh, just, sorry, there's one more thing. Uh, so in principle, this mean free path could also be determined by a few different things, right? It could be scattering of the phonons off of some kind of impurities. Yes. Or it could be due to uh, interactions between each other. So what mean free, what lambda are we talking about here? So um, we, could, we can essentially include all, all the scattering mechanisms in that mean free path. You're absolutely well, right. Okay. Um, what we generally do is we start off with the inclusion first of the three phonon scattering, then the inclusion of the uh, impurity, and then you can include the inclusion of, of electrons, and you can you can keep adding these these scattering devices. So so rough, roughly when I write down that that mean free path here, it's meant as a as a guide. It's not meant as a th this this is the mean free path um, of the of 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 our of our phonon. Um, because as you said, there's so much, there's, there's so many mechanisms that contribute to the mean free path. What I, what I will say also is that, is, is that um, as, as we'll see, is that there's a spectrum to mean free paths for all these different phonon modes, and that spectrum is quite large. And actually that, that large spectrum um, means that that simple length to, to mean free path approach is, is helpful, but you still have to solve the Boltzmann transport equation to really be able to predict um, deviations from Fourier, from Fourier transport. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, experimentally, we're going to use the wavelength of light to, to reach these, these uh, smaller length scales. One, one such experiment that, that we work with is something called pump probe reflectance. Um, and essentially what we're doing in this experiment is we uh, take our sample and we coat it with a thin layer of aluminum um, that effect effectively acts as a transducer where it's converting optical energy into thermal energy. And uh, in, this, in this case here, what we're doing is we pump that uh, aluminum layer um, and then we, then we heat up that aluminum layer and we track the change in the reflectance of that aluminum layer with, with temperature. And we, we assume that there's basically a thermal reflectance coefficient um, that linearly relates the change in reflectivity to, uh, to temperature. And we can uh, model this uh, geometry using our, 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 our diffusion equation. And we can essentially fit our, our temperature decay curves um, um, uh, as a function of time, um, according, according to Fourier's law. And how would we go about introducing a Lang scale? Well, we can essentially change the, uh, the spot size of your, um, of your pump and probe. Now, one thing about this, this geometry that, that I consider to be a drawback is this introduction of an interface between the aluminum and our sample. Um, and that really introduces an unknown. If we're really interested in, in, look, in studying phonon properties, um, it would be nice to not have this, this, uh, this interface here. Um, so what, what approach uh, brings us out of that, out of that drawback? Um, and that approach is this transient thermal grading approach where we um, essentially uh, it's another pump probe type of, of geometry, but in this case, we use a, a phase mask to diffract our, our pump beam and then re-interfere it in our sample here, uh, creating a, 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 a sinusoidal heating profile. Um, and we can track the intensity of the sinusoidal heating profile in time um, with a probe beam, right? So this probe beam is going to be diffracted off our, uh, off our temperature profile that we've created and we can again look at our at our at our temperature profile in time and compare that with with our, our theory. So what would we see um, with with in this geometry, right? So we have this this sinusoidal temperature profile that we've created with a specific length scale that is the grading period, and diffusion would tell us we can solve this this diff, the, this temperature diffusion equation. Um, and what, what would that give us? Well, it would tell us that the uh, decay rate for, for the temperature profile um, is linear proportional to the, to the uh, wave vector of our, of our grading period, right? So we can sweep through different grading periods um, 
And what will we see here, right? So I'm just showing you some raw data on a, on a silicon film, for example. And what would we see, uh, what would we expect to see in terms of decay rate for a diffusion model? Well, we'd expect to see a, a, a linear relationship um, as, as dictated by the diffusion equation. Um, but what do we actually see is as we go to, to, to small gratings or large, um, uh, large wave vectors, right, is we see a deviation um, in this decay rate. And so the challenge really is, is, is how to go about predicting uh, th this deviation. And that's where the Boltzmann transport equation um, comes back. And now we've introduced this, this source term here on the right-hand side um, that essentially describes the geometry of our, of, our, of our heating profile. And so we're going to go about solving this equation for our experiment now. Um, and then we use two ways to do that, or a, use a combination of, of numerical and, and analytical approaches. So I'm just roughly going to go over quickly how we do that numerically. And, and we use Monte Carlo for that. So what we're doing is essentially we're, we're simulating the random walk of phonons uh, in, in, our, in our experiment. And if we do that enough times, if we roll enough dice, uh, we can calculate our, uh, our macroscopic heat flux, temperature, energy, et cetera. Um, analytically, how do we deal with this? Well, well, one approach that we we came up with is, is, is what we call a variational solution. And that essentially imposes a, a, a trial function for the temperature profile that we're looking for. So we can insert that temperature profile into our, um, into our BTE and apply energy conservation as a, con as a constraint. And then we can solve for that effective uh, decay constant that we're after. Um, so, it's a little bit of a um, question of if we're looking for something that's non-diffusive, why would we start with the non? Why would we start with the diffusive solution for temperature? Um, and that's a good question. But essentially, what we were, we're saying is that we're not too far from uh, the diffusive regime. So you can still say that the um, decay would roughly follow an exponential, but with a modified decay rate. Um, and So, sorry, where? Q, oh, QN. Um, th th this this just describes the the, sh the shape of the profile that we that we put in, and it's a, and it's just a thermal distribution for the phonons. Yeah, so it's just like each phonon has a modal specific heat, and that that modal specific heat basically is a probability um, contribution to the overall specific heat. So it's so it's you're 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 thermally excited. You're creating a thermal distribution um, uh, of of your TTG profile, uh, but you can create with this framework. We can choose which profiles we can create, and we'll we'll actually see getting to the end that that what that Q ma ma that matters at the end of the day. What, what goes? Yeah. So so the, there seem to be quite clearly a departure from the diffusive behavior. Yes. Right. So, so um, that could be sort of the, the transport is not well described by the So it could be also that the the phonon system is not sort of equilibrium. Not not th not, not thermal. thermal. Right. So um, that's a, that's a good point. And what we we do a couple things about that is we um, we we try to stay in the linear regime if that makes sense in the sense that there's no dependence on the pump power that we're um, that we're dumping into the system. So so the those decay rates will stay the same um, if we increase the, the pump power. And what that means uh, theoretically is that these these phonons are not too far from from equilibrium. They're not too non-equilibrium, right? So there's so it, we're in this linearized deviation. From this 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 equilibrium position, um, and that that's that's something that is kind of implicit in, in this Boltzmann transport equation, um, and it would be interesting to to go beyond that, but um, theoretically we're not quite there yet. Uh, okay, so we have this this variational and Monte Carlo approach. Um, what material would we we choose to study, right? So I uh, I mentioned earlier that these these mean free paths. And their contributions to the thermal transport can have a huge range. And I'm showing you that is the case here for something like silicon germanium, um, where you can see that there's a large contribution in this, in this red circled area 
of, of, of phonons that have sort of on the, the tens of micron uh, mean free path. So what that would mean um, uh, experimentally is we don't actually have to go into, into this nanometer uh, length scale regime. We can just go to the tens of micron regime and we can expect to see uh, deviations from, from diffusive here. And, and even though it's an alloy, we can still use our, our DFT approach to, to calculating the phonon properties with the inclusion of some, some, mo some model for the um, associated disorder. Um, and what we will see here is that our, uh, our variational solution, even with the imposing of a, of a trial function uh, from, from the diffusion equation, uh, does reasonably well, or very well in this case, for our, our as compared to our Monte Carlo um, solution. Um, and we can go ahead and, and test that experimentally, right? We can, we can variationally predict the temperature profile using inputs from our density functional theory. And then we can experimentally put our silicon germanium sample in our TTG, in front of our TTG lasers. Um, in this case, I'm using, we're using a slightly different geometry here, so, right? So you can, sorry, run your, your, your sample either in uh, transmission or in reflection mode. If you're using a bulk sample, um, it's nice to be able to do things in the reflection mode. Um, in that case, it's a slightly more complicated uh, trial function, but that's not an issue. In any case, we are able to actually predict these temperature profile um, and in silicon germanium without any fitting parameters. So we have this, this uh, observable um, in our experiment, and we have this BTE theory that we are able to, to predict um, just, just straight from, uh, from using density functional theory. So we can do that for a range of gratings. And you can see here that if we were to, to, to extract our, our effective decay, or in this, in this case, effective thermal conductivity, um, you can see here that our theory, the black line, uh, does a nice job of, of predicting our, our experiment. Um, and so what, where would the diffusive regime lie on this, on this curve, right? So it, it would lie in the large grading period where there is no um, dependence on the grading period. And then we've introduced some size effects here. Um, in our in our experiment, right? And you can see if we if I change the uh, alloy composition, right? There's some some nice sensitivity here, and you can see um, that we can recover that sensitivity um, in, in our experiment as well. Uh, so uh, and and just shown here is what we expect for for silicon, for instance. So this is a nice demonstration of this platform um, that shows that we can. Uh, without any fitting parameters, estimate the uh, deviation from, from Fourier. Um, so we, we've looked at this, this intermediate regime, the size effects regime, um, but it's also natural to ask what else would we expect if we look at something from, from this Boltzmann transporter picture. And one thing that we, we know is that the Boltzmann transport equation um, in the case of, of fluids can be used as, as a starting point to derive Navier-Stokes. So it's natural to think about that sort of uh, picture, that sort of question in this case here. Um, we don't have a, have a, have a fluid for se, per se, but we have uh, these phonons. Would, would we ever encounter a situation where we have a fluid of phonons? Right? So far, what we've, what we've discussed can be thought of it more so as a, as a gas of phonons. And, and indeed, you do see this, this uh, hydrodynamic regime emerge in under certain situations. <clears throat> so where, where did this story start with phonon hydrodynamics? Uh, well, it started with, with looking at, at uh, superfluid helium um, below, below the, the critical temperature. Um, and in that case, what, what they observed in, in uh, heat experiments on superfluid helium was that Above the critical temperature, um, if you uh, initiated a heat pulse at one end of your superfluid helium sample and, tr and recorded the, the temperature, um, you would follow the diffusion equation um, where the maximum temperature resides sort of at that, at that initial uh, point, and it just follows that, that natural bell curve that we, we know. Um, but below uh, 2.17 Kelvin, a very different story emerged where that heat pulse actually uh, remained uh, a heat pulse and began to propagate throughout through the system um, at, at a speed of, of second sound. Uh, 
And there's uh, some nice videos on, on YouTube of, of showing you how um, with very simple equipment, you can actually observe this um, in superfluid helium. Okay, but uh, that was superfluid helium and we're interested in, in semiconductors and crystalline solids. Um, there's theorists posited that indeed, uh, you can extend that, that, that same uh, expectation to, to these materials. Um, under the condition that normal processes dominated over, over umquat processes. So recall when we first spoke about phonons, we spoke about this um, three scattering process where you have two phonons merging into, into one. Well, you can further categorize that process in terms of normal processes and umquat processes. And the distinction being that normal processes conserve momentum, right? So if you look at the wave vector of these two phonon modes here, um, they merge into a third, um, preserving the original direction um, of, the of the first two. Um, on the flip side, we have this umclap process, which uh, unintuitively, because of the uh, translational symmetry of our, of our crystals, um, we can insert this wave vector here, uh, G, which is a, uh, uh, a linear combination of, of the reciprocal lattice vectors of our, of our crystal. Um, and that allows us to actually flip this, this wave vector. And we can say that, that this would um, reduce the, uh, relax the momentum. And you can understand that as that now you had, you had momentum that was initially going in one direction and now is going um, in the uh, opposite direction. Um, yes. Uh, I, I, what second about it is that it's it's not traveling at the the first speed of sound. Uh, okay. <laughs> so the first so the first speed of sound in um, in in a in a uh, let's let's go to it here. Um, so so they they you they they test this theory in a, in a handful of, of of solids right. So for the first solids were. Solid, solid helium, sodium fluoride, and bismuth, and all, all roughly at these very low temperatures. Um, and, and again, a very similar experiment to the, to the superfluid helium where you do this heat pulse, you trigger heat pulse, and you monitor the temperature at the other end. And what they, what they observed was that you have this first initial pulse here um, that corresponds to the, the first sound. So it's your, it's your long wavelength phonons that don't carry a lot of heat. Um, that are not interacting with the other phonons and they're just propagating from one end to the other. And then you have this uh, large peak here um, and you can see it's, a delay, it's delayed by some amount of time um, that carries most of the temperature, most of the energy um, and it, it reaches the other end of the, the sample, right? So, um, uh, what, so, so you have the, this differentiation in the speed of sound and, and what, you're, what we're seeing here is really this collective mechanism where the phonons um, scatter amongst themselves, but they do so in a very uh, controlled way that preserves this momentum, preserves this directionality of the heat flux and is able to reach the other end of the sample. So, so, is, is, so the, the, this, this uh, is something that was, this was done in the seventies um, and, and, and really remains sort of a, uh, some, something that never really caught on, I guess you could say, and, and, and sort of stayed, stayed in the 70s until uh, with, our, with the new tools of density functional theory and materials like graphene, um, we can now look for, for this criteria where normal scattering um, dominates over, over umclap. And what we do find in these, uh, in these, these 2D materials is this, is this uh, emergence of of phono, or, or this likelihood of, of phonohydrodynamics where that condition is satisfied. So in this case, um, my colleague Sangyup showed that um, in, in graphene, you, you, do, you do see this, this normal, the strong normal scattering over umclap scattering. Um, but that, that means we're, 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 we're still, we still have this candidate material, but how do we go about going from that candidate material to an experimental geometry? Um, that it will allow us to observe this this effect, right? And and for that we need to to actually uh, solve uh, the BTE again. And if you recall, um, our original form of the BTE um, has this this 
uh, scattering term here. And, and what's, imp what's implied in this form of the scattering term is that the, uh, every mode uh, sort of trivially relaxes to the equilibrium distribution independent of the state of other modes. And we know that this is not true, um, right? So it's essentially assuming that whatever the, the state of, this other, of these other modes are that are in the system, um, that this mode will relax at this rate divided by tau. What we know is that there is that the way the relaxation occurs is through exchanging with other modes, uh, other populations of other modes. Um, and so what we need to do is actually insert, um, in this case, a, a, cup, a coupling between these other modes. And so it takes the form of, of, of not a scalar, but a matrix. Um, and, and in doing so, that allows us to effectively uh, treat uh, normal and umclet processes um, as, as distinct. Um, and so I'm just sort of schematically showing you that we're now um, carefully doing a careful bookkeeping exercise of the way energy is, is deposited through the system, um, through the different channels um, into the different photon modes. Okay, so our BT looks a little different now, um, but we can still use the same approaches. We can still add a source term here. And we have this uh, collision operator that is populated with um, basically the, the, the scattering amplitudes that we've calculated from, from density functional theory. And we can take our, our, uh, our Fourier transform of this equation um, and convert it from, from this uh, uh, differential integral equation into an algebraic one. And uh, that allows us essentially to uh, go about solving for temperature in, a, in an analytical way. Um, and the reason we can do this is that essentially we, we, ha we don't have we, we don't have any uh, boundaries. This is, this is an, um, uh, an infinite system we just, and, and, the, and the size effect, uh, the, the knob that we have is, is our, our heating term on the right-hand side there. So using energy conservation, we can essentially rearrange for a, a closed form expression for temperature. And um, we, we, we essentially have a, a, have a Green's function solution to the, to the BT. So if you, if you recall our experiment, right, that we use for silicon germanium, this, this uh, grading experiment, we can um, impose the same energy uh, profile here. Um, what's very nice is that this 1D profile, so we had a slightly more complicated profile here, but this 1D profile is really sort of a, a, a basis, if you will, um, in, in Fourier space. So essentially this 1D profile, you can form any heating profile you want from a, a linear superposition of these 1D profiles. Um, but what's nice is that, as, as we'll see, this 1D profile is actually sufficient to describe um, heat transfer in, in strongly anisotropic materials like graphene and graphite, uh, where, where the energy moves mostly in plane and not cross plane. So our, our solution to the BT um, in, uh, for these very simple geometries, such as the 1D TTG, don't require any, any variational and, and, and Monte Carlo techniques. They simply require um, linear algebra. So we can use you know, our large linear algebra libraries um, and perform this matrix inversion, which could be very large uh, for any frequency and, and, and grading period. So essentially we solve for the temperature in the, in the, in the Fourier domain. Um, but but solving, solving this equation, the next question becomes, what actually are the hydrodynamic signatures that, that we, that we um, will see? Um, and, and so as part of the, 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 the past work on photon hydrodynamics, um, people qualitatively arrived at this, at, this, uh, um, at this wave equation. And you can see here, right? So the, these two terms would correspond to the standard diffusion equation. And now we've introduced this uh, uh, second derivative of time, um, which turns it into a wave equation. And in the Fourier domain, right? What would our, our, our expression for temperature look like? Right. Well, it would it would look like a a, a resonance um, at a given frequency. So what we're actually looking for is some uh, some resonances in our in our solution, and we can go ahead and, and check um, using our our, our DFT uh, properties for for graphite in this case um, at at 100 Kelvin. Right. So graphite and graphene are are, are close cousins of one another. One is much more amenable to experiments. Um, <laughs> That being graphite, uh, and so in this case we 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 just worked with graphite for for now, um, and what we do see is indeed we do recover this this resonance um, uh, 
um, you know, a, a, a sort of the mid mega, megahertz or uh, hundreds of megahertz uh, frequency here. Um, so th this is all just theoretical solutions to the BTE. Experimentally, it's more useful just to look in the time domain uh, version, right? So what do we expect here, right? Well, we expect the, um, that the temperature profile follows a, 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 a damped wave um, behavior. And you can relate the um, time constants and the frequencies to um, these parameters of, the, of, your, of your wave equation. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just rushing a bit here. But intuitively, what does that look like in our, in our TTG experiment? Well, we start off again with our, our sinusoidal temperature profile. And if we look how that temperature profile evolves in time um, in the diffusion equation, right? So you're, if you look at the hottest point, it will just slowly, slowly relax till you reach a, a flat equilibrium background temperature. Um, and the way it does that uh, in accordance with the diffusion equation is through this um, exponential. And what would we see in the, um, in, 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 the wave, in the wave case, in the photon hydrodynamic case, uh, we actually see a, uh, a standing wave um, behavior, right? So our, uh, our, our sinusoidal profile now um, actually uh, goes between oscillating at the maximum to a, to a minimum and then, and then back. And so we're, what we're seeing here is essentially this, um, this phase flip where the maximum is shifted by one half period uh, corresponding in time to a, uh, a change in sign in our temperature. So this is our signature that we're after, right? Is this change in sign um, in our, in our, in our uh, temperature profile. And we would like to see, know if we see that experimentally. So what do we do? We uh, go back to our TTG and we put our graphene sample in our cryostat. And we don't actually have to go to, to liquid helium. We can just use our, our, our nitrogen. Um, and we, a commercial graphite sample is what we started with. And we just um, essentially use the same experiment that we used for, for germanium. And we can ask ourselves, what will we see um, at, these, at, these, at these temperatures, right? Do we see the diffusive case or do we see the um, damped wave behavior. That is our, our signature. And what we do see at 85 Kelvin in graphite is that at very large gratings, so or very large, I mean, at large gratings, 24 microns, we see our, um, our, our, our exponential-like behavior. But then as we go to smaller and smaller gratings, um, we see this uh, uh, phase flip emerging. In our, in our temperature profiles. Um, and on the, the right here, I'm showing you what we predict from uh, our solutions to the BTE. Again, no, no fitting parameters. Um, and we can, we can really match what we're seeing um, experimentally, at least qualitatively. Um, and we can, uh, furthermore, we can extract this, the speed of sound by, by looking at, by using the wave vectors of our, of our gratings and the frequencies of these oscillations um, to create a, a, a linear relationship. And, um, the speed of sound, if I remember, for second speed of sound, the second sound speed is something like 3,400 meters per second um, at, this, at this temperature. So we, we, indu we indeed do see this, this phase flip here. Um, as, as further confirmation of this, we can, uh, we can look, we can change temperature and not only change our, our length scale. So we've done that as well. And we look at what happens as we go from 200 to, to 50 Kelvin. Um, and you can see at, 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 a, at a grading period of 10 for graphene, you'll see that we, at 200, we have this nearly diffusive uh, transport. And then as we cool to, to 100, you do see that this uh, strong indication of, of, of wave-like transport. And then as we cool even further, you can see that we, um, um, that the, the the decay moves back up above above zero, and that's that's because it's entered the, into the ballistic regime. Yeah. So okay. we can. Samuel, can I can I just interrupt? Uh, so. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, my... Just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my naive expectation would have been that at larger temperatures. 
you have more phonons. And as a result, you have more of these uh, processes in which uh, phonons uh, you know, do not scatter from say impurities, but rather from each other and in these momentum conserving ways. And so as a result, it is actually, I would have anticipated that it's larger temperatures at which you see a sort of hydrodynamic behavior emerge. Um, yeah, so what, what actually happens at larger temperatures is that you're now exciting modes um, closer to the Bruin zone edge. And those, and because those modes are closer to the Bruin zone edge, those modes are more likely to be, uh, the scattering processes with those modes are more likely to be umklap because they're large wave, they're large wave vector modes. I see, so you're in your system, basically, I could almost forget about impurities. Really what's happening is that at the lowest temperatures, you have far too few, far too few phonons. They just hit the boundaries at most. And so they ballistically propagate. Yes. Increase temperature, you go into hydrodynamic regime. And then eventually, if you increase temperature further, you, you, you start these umclap processes with break momentum conservation and then hydrodynamic scales. Exactly. Okay, thank you. And uh, right, so so essentially, we we have mapped that phase diagram of where we expect to observe hydrodynamics in in, um, in graphite. Okay, so we have this this observation. Um, how far can we we push this fluid analogy? Well, uh, we go back to our, our simulations and we we look at, for instance, graphene in this in the source sink geometry. So it's a it's a ribbon of graphene. Um, what, what, what will we see? Um, I've given away the punchline in the, in the slide title, but in the diffusive, in the diffusive re regime, if we look at these black lines, which are, are basically the, the flux streamlines here, right? You can see that they're always proportional um, to the temperature gradient, um, which, is, which is Fourier's law. But if you solve the BTE, um, we see this emergence of, of, of vortices here. And so we're trying to understand a little bit more about what we can do with these vortices and, and, and where they come from. Um, and I, I will also point out that uh, these whirlpools, these vortices have, have been observed uh, in, in the electronic uh, case of, of hydrodynamics in, in graphene. So, so we're, we're seeing a lot of, of parallels um, between what, what people find in, in graphene um, versus in, in electron hydrodynamics and what we are finding in, in photohydrodynamics. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, and some very preliminary work. It's natural to ask, right, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about fluids, right, you might start to think about, about rectification, right? So, you know, flow might be uh, more conductive one way and, and more resistive the other way. So I'm, I'm trying to, we're trying to understand um, if we play around with these geometries enough, um, and, and solve BT, our BTE for, for, for graphene or for very simple materials, right? Do we, do we see essentially differences in our temperature profile um, if, we, um, if we apply, if we, if we flip our hot and cold sides? And very early indications suggest that yes, yes, we do um, see some differences in the temperature profile, not, not actually in the center line, but near the, near the boundaries of, of these geometries. So, so the, these are the types of questions that we're, we're, we're sort of, we're asking ourselves, um, rectification is a bit of a, a, a it's, it's been a bit of a dead end really for, for thermal stuff. So I'm not sure how far this will actually go. Um, in any case, I, I think the combination with hydrodynamics and, and rectification is, is interesting. And so we, we, once, once you have this tool, you start seeing fun hydrodynamics in, in all sorts of uh, materials. So uh, we see it actually in crystalline polymers at, at uh, crystalline polyethylene, for instance, at, at 100 Kelvin. Um, I, as I said, graphene is, is a very good candidate. So we, we have some, we haven't attempted anything uh, to date, but there's been discussion of, of how to do this same TTG experiment on graphene, um, which is not an easy experiment to do. Um, and we are, we're also, as an engineer, I'm asking myself, how can I engineer this phenomena? Um, how can I design materials, right? So if I, if I think about introducing a, a super lattice, right, I can, I can essentially preferentially control the direction which uh, sec, second sound um, exists, right? So um, these materials are, are hard to make in the lab, but easy for us to, to make um, in our computer simulations. And so my last, uh, my last, 
case study that I want to go over is that we've, we've spent some time here looking at the size effects in silicon germanium and looking at phonohydrodynamics in graphite. And we saw a little bit of the ballistic regime in graphite, but I want to show you that we can see the ballistic regime not at these low temperatures, um, but at room temperature in, in, in silicon if, if we, if we are, are careful with our experiment. Um, and and what, what we actually need to do is, is uh, we actually need to go to Italy where they have a free electron laser and they can, uh, they can use that free electron laser to, to, to create an extreme UV uh, light source. Um, and so that, that means that now that we have, we have, before we were working the visible regime, so our gratings were restricted sort of by that, you know, 500 nanometers over, over two um, uh, diffraction limit. And now we, we can go beyond that with the CUV source. We can run the same experiment, um, but now we're, now we're talking about tens of nanometers. Um, and, and that allows us to, to access this, this diffusive uh, ballistic regime, sorry. Right, so it's, it's, the, it's the equivalent um, principle where you create, a, you create a grading by interfering to two light sources and then you come in with your, your probe here and you track the, uh, the intensity of, of your probe. So uh, I, was, I was distantly involved um, with the experimental uh, part of this but um, I'm working on, on the actual interpretation of the results. And what we're finding here is that, again, we can use this, the solution to the BTE uh, to track our, our, um, our temperatures in these systems. And, and so what we're looking at is 280 nanometers um, and, and 69 nanometers. And uh, we, can, we do indeed see the, uh, that, that our BTE can uh, capture this uh, um, temperature decay. Uh, and the, if you see that these graphs look very different, where are these oscillations coming from? Are they are they second sound? No, they're they're uh, surface acoustic waves, um, and um, essentially they're 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 present in in both scenarios. But uh, basically, the sensitivity to the different probe lengths um, means that the that the um, surface acoustic waves really pop out in the uh, um, in the extreme extreme UV. So it, to put that all into a a chart, right? So if we look at our grading period for this TTG experiment and our decay time, um, and we look at what decay constants we would see in our different regimes, we have our, our ballistic here and our diffusive in, in orange and our BTE solution in blue here. And you can see that the 69 nanometer K, uh, case falls right into this, into more or less on, onto the ballistic uh, regime. And this is at, at 300 Kelvin, right? So we can, if, if we generate a small enough length scale, we can um, see ballistic transport at, at, at room temperature in photons, uh, in silicon. And so what, what we've, this work really explores the different uh, transport regimes in, in, um, in semiconductors um, in the context of phonons. And for the work that I'm hoping to do here at McGill with, with some of you is, is to explore more of that and then to, use, to, to build up some of these tools really. So, so there's, there's plenty of work to be done with, the, with hydrodynamics. Um, and I would like to, to study more the, the, uh, the low temperature ballistic uh, type of, of, of questions uh, with potential applications for, for quantum computing. Um, there's, a, there's a regime that I, that I ignored or forgot and, um, and that's the localization uh, regime as well, and, and that's been um, observed in, in, in certain cases too with phonons. So uh, we could we could add that here to the to this plot as well. So with that, I will uh, thank the many people who made this happen, and uh, take any any questions that you might have. The spot, yeah. So you, um, so for graphite, we were looking at tens of microjoules. Um, we we went up to hundred uh, microjoules, um, and with graphene, you probably actually have, I think, have to go to that be just because the absor absorption is is so low. Yeah, yeah. you're just you, you're like you, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that so that that's been that's been the big um, hurdle to get over with with graphene. Um, 
So I'm, I'm actually, I might be talking with uh, Michael Hilke to use ramen as, a, as another, as an in, indirect probe of, of second sound. We'll, but um, yeah, so, so tens of, of microjoules. And then spot size, you, you at least want, we had some heuristic about having sort of 10 grading periods or so. So, so your, that, your spot size, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 10 re repeats of it, yeah. So we have also some uh, questions from the Zoom audience. Uh, Andre Marie, can you ask? So in the in the electrical conductivity, there's the Machiavelli Regel criterion that says that when the mean speed passes equals to the lattice spacing, the conductivity, electrical conductivity shifts. So my question is, do you find the same thing with formal? Um, there, there will there will be some similar criterion for that the the bte is not uh well suited in its current form um to describing that that limit is is the, is the quick answer to that and the other question is uh, when you write the uh, temperature dependence of the thermal conductivity there is a the central formula that comes in that you showed that has a specific heat so my question is, uh, is the temperature dependence of the specific heat relevant at high temperature in your experiment or not? Tem temperature dependence of the thermal conductivity? <laughs> the formula you wrote for thermal conductivity, uh, there's a simple formula that you wrote at the end that contains the specific heat. Right? You have the square of the velocity times the yes. step in rate yeah. times the specific heat. Yes. So my question is, if you look at the thermal conductivity as a function of temperature, is there any sizable contribution from the specific heat or the temperature dependence of the specific heat, I should say? Yes, yeah, so it, it's, it's, that, that formula is, captures the, uh, um, the, the, essentially, if you look at if you look at all the thermal conductivity curves that you see, you, you see experimentally, right, where you see the the peak, you see the increase, which is the, at low temperatures, which is due to the samples being in the ballistic regime, and then you see a peak in the thermal conductivity, and then the the decrease is a function of temperature, right? If you had a if you had an infinite sample, um, and you took that sample all the way all the way to zero Kelvin, you would just see you would see a divergence in the thermal conductivity. As a function of temperature with that formula. Does that make sense? Uh, no, because the specific heat should vanish at zero temperature. So, so it's a question of which 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 goes to zero faster. Um, uh, and so what we what we do what we do see is that essentially the the, the ballistic regime takes over, right? So you're 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 introducing a uh, a scattering process at the boundaries. But if you had a if you had no scattering process at the boundaries, the lifetimes would be infinite. So which go, which goes to 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 in, which goes to zero and which goes to infinity faster? This is the question. Thank you. Okay, Michelle, do you want to ask? Yes. Uh, thanks for the nice talks. Uh, actually, I have some uh, question about the details of the calculations. Um, I'd like to know which code is used to evaluate. Uh, matrix elements that you are using and what kind of like um, refinements of the Q grid is used uh, when in these transports uh, calculations? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, we use, I'm familiar with Quantum Espresso um, and that, that does the job for, for things like silicon and, and graphene and graphite. Um, and to, to construct the, the, the Q mesh that we are, are calculating from, uh, we, we essentially are, are doing this, this interpolation procedure uh, where we, we calculate from first principles, the force constants at, a very, at very few Q points, if you will, or combinations of Q points. And then we uh, Fourier interpolate those to um, a, a finer mesh, and that seems to work well. Um, and the mesh sizes really depend on the material, um, but roughly you, speaking, if you for, for silicon you can you can go to a Q mesh of, of 25 by 25 by 25, 
and that seems to be sufficient to, to achieve a, a converged thermal conductivity at, at room temperature. Uh, but something like something like graphene requires a much finer mesh because you have that um, a quadratic uh, ZA mode. So so it really is very 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 material dependent. Okay, and then you do you have your own code to do the, the Boltzmann transport uh, resolving of the equations? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So I understand that you're evaluating the like the kind of the the scattering of tree phonons within quantum espresso. Yeah. It's, well, so what we what we do within free not free uh, and what we do within quantum espresso is we actually calculate these force constants. And we extract these force constants in this, uh, what's called a, a, a real space displacement method, where you essentially have a supercell of your, of your material and you displace uh, systematically one or two atoms. Um, and in doing so, that, in doing that procedure enough times, you can essentially construct these, these tensors here. Um, and, so, uh, so, so you do that within a supercell approach? Yes, with the supercell approach. Okay. Thank you. Okay, maybe one last question, Mark. Hi, thanks. Um, nice talk. If you do perturbation theory of anharmonic phonons, the fourth order term is equal in size to the third order term. What effect does that have on your approach? Yes, so um, what, what we do see is, for instance, at, at high temperatures, these fourth order processes will contribute more uh, to the thermal transport, will, will impact more of the thermal transport. Um, so we would, need, we would need to include that here. Um, and what, another thing is, is, is that we've, we've essentially assumed no, uh, no temperature dependence on any of these, these terms, these force constants, um, these frequencies. So if, if we really wanted to be self-consistent, uh, we could we could we could introduce a, a self-consistent way of doing this calculation um, that would include a, a temperature dependence on these, these terms, and that would allow things like uh, allow for things like frequency shifts um, to, to occur. So uh, it, it 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 would change, but the the impacts are, are on on the dy for instance from the hydrodynamics that that signature would still hold. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you so much.